In the next 20 minutes, what I intend to do is engage you as much as possible. A lot of fun, a lot of energy, also a lot of congruence. What I talk about, I've walked, and I think that's very, very important. And also challenge. So I'll try to make it as memorable as possible because I know your attention spans are that amount. In February 2007, Stanford Business School Advisory Committee said that the most important attribute to develop was self-awareness. So now it's becoming very, very big currency. And what I want to do in this 20 minutes is basically give you a few tools. And what I think is with these tools, you, you begin the journey towards self-awareness, you improve as a person, and that energy will bring and create a better workplace. I think we need to localize everything in life. Forget about that out there for a minute. What can I do to make a difference? What can I do to create a great workplace? And that's what I'm focusing on here. I think the more we walk the path, the more we integrate all these ideas, the better and greater workplace you work in. Okay. I remember doing a seminar in Dublin, it was some years back, and before I was introduced by the HR director, this guy shouted out from the back, he says, Jesus, when is this going to be over? Wasn't a good start. Now I'm looking at a few of you and you're thinking the same thing. Okay, and I, so I realized, obviously, you're in HR, you understand training very well, that we had a problem in the training environment and we were going to have to do something with it. So I got up and stood up and I says, look at 15, 20 minutes, we'll be out of here. And I said, um, tell me, I said, uh, what, what's your name? And he says, Christy. I says, great, Christy. I said, Christy, I want you to imagine for a minute that you are interviewing me for a job, OK? And I just said to the rest of the audience, there's about 80 people there, I want you to assess my kind of approach into the interview room situation. And Christy was interviewing me. Have you got that? So Christy is interviewing me. And I'm going to be going down and be interviewed by Christy, and I have all the audience assessing my first impressions and such. So I walked all the way down to Christy. How's it going, Christy? And back. So I said again, I said, just remember again, Christy is interviewing me for a sales job, and I'd just like you to assess my kind of approach into the sales interview situation. Down I went again. I know, we're the one of how are you doing, Christy? And I went back. Not to labor the point, I did it for a third time. Then I said, I said, um, Christy, I said, um, what did you think of that? And Christy said, well, I thought A, B, and C. A and B weren't workable. C was quite good. So approximately 10 minutes later, I started looking at the other side of the audience. And I said, you know, as Christy mentioned earlier, and I repeated what he said, slightly packaged, but nonetheless, you know, got the message across. Now, at this stage, Christy had moved from being, you know, I want out of here, to sitting in the following way. Now remember, as I said, you have an intimate link between your physiology, the way you look, and your psychology, the way you think. So basically, all I have to do is look at you and you're giving me a printout of your thinking, aren't you? And it's rarely, you rarely lie. So at this stage, Christy was like this. Half an hour later, an hour and a half later. We went for a drink in juries after that. He got a high chair, and he set up in the high chair, similar posture. Now, interestingly, I'm not for a minute going to say to you that Christy remembered anything or some of what I said. I'm not going to go there, OK? But I am going to say that as a trainer, I managed to diffuse a major problem in the training environment so that the people that wanted to learn could listen. Teachers open the door, but you must enter by yourself. As a trainer, I want to make sure that we can get to open the door. So that's what I did. This is a huge, huge philosophy. How many people here genuinely believe in the following? That you could leave this seminar today, stop at the petrol station, let's say, or any convenience store, and meet somebody who will have more resonance and will have much more to say to you about your own life and will have a message for you than anything you could hear in the whole conference today. And many people genuinely are open to that possibility. Hands up. Fantastic. And you've been very, very honest. I would suggest that the difference between people that tap into their potential or not are the people that genuinely buy into that philosophy. I believe everybody can be my teacher. And I live my philosophies off that. And in terms of, and we're going to move on to setting unbelievable goals and compelling visions. If you decide 
that not everybody can be your teacher, you are cutting off your lifeblood and your chances of succeeding in that particular venture are very, very minimal. Remember, for example, very briefly, children realize there's no such thing as failure, only feedback. They crawl, they get up, they fall face down, they adapt, they learn from their failure, they try again. Ultimately, through a process of learning from failure, they ultimately succeed. Children, remember, can be crying one moment and blissful the next. They totally live in the moment. We tend to be moany at the start, moany at the middle, and moany at the end. So, there are, I'm digressing, but there is a huge amount you can learn from a child. Absolutely. The number one thing that stops people from setting up a business, I do a lot of work with Enterprise Ireland, is fear of failure. Look at a child, no fear. Fear is learned, I believe it can be unlearned. In 1996, my intuition told me that I should write a best-selling book. So, what I did was, I got a piece of paper, a A4 sheet, and I wrote on it, I am a best-selling author. Don't feel sorry for me. And I put this over my workspace. On the back of my door, I also pinned up the same sheet, I am a best-selling author. But every dream, as they say, comes with a deadline. So another A4 sheet was placed beside it, which says, manuscript finished by a certain date. Again, beside I am a best-selling author, over my workspace, on the back of the door. My focus was completely and totally on the dream. Now the interesting thing about intuition, which I believe is pure connection, I believe it's the greatest opportunity available to people as a resource, as a tool, is that a lot of people get these intuitive understandings of circumstances, of dreams, of people, but don't honor them. Or they get this huge dream and they say, okay now for a minute, do you know what we'll do? We'll take out another piece of paper. And what we'll write on the piece of paper is the pros and cons. Okay? And I want to give you something, a very interesting quote on the pros and cons. Is the following. That when you left brain any dream or compelling vision you have, you will always find enough reasons not to act. Let me explain. If at that time I decided that, yeah, uh, I'm going to take out the pros and cons. Here were the pros and cons. One of the major pros was my core belief. My core belief is, remember how this links in, is that I believe that when you dare to dream, add in positive intent, you have the ability to attract teachers, circumstances, and events to help you achieve your dream. Let me repeat that, very important point. I believe that even in the context of me dreaming of being an international speaker, that I have the ability when I focus on the dream and if the intent is positive, that I can attract teachers, circumstances, and events to help me achieve my dream. So that was my core belief. At the time, I was a consultant as well, which was useful. You had access to people. And finally, I had a whole pile of energy. Energy tends to work. Now, on the other hand, I had a few cons. I got a D in English in my Leaving Cert. But, you know, I was consistent because I got a D in English in my Junior Cert as well. Interestingly enough, quite a lot of people will tell you that if you are going to write a best-selling book, you need to be fairly good at English. Not necessarily so, as we'll prove. Similarly, at that time, in 1996, no Irish person had written a book on motivation self-help. In this particular niche, there had been books, of course, on raising children, positive self-esteem, but just in this exact niche, I hadn't really got a whole pile of references apart from Americans and English, etc. And also, from the world of journalism, two people that David would know, both of them said to me, no hope. Absolutely no hope whatsoever I was going to write a best-selling book. Now, what I'm showing you here is, and I want you to always localize my advice, you too may have a dream, and if you left brain it and go pros and cons, I am guaranteeing you, you will definitely find enough reasons not to act. I want to say to you, and bring it right back to the whole team of today, finally. Ultimately, the more you work on yourself, the more you journey towards self-awareness, the people you attract outside at the coffee break or at the discos, are people that are just like you. Hopefully focused, energetic, warm, excited. That's what you'll tend to attract. So my bottom line is, if you want to create a great workplace, start with yourself. Gurmila Malvo, thank you very much.